Hi, yes, um, so my name is Rebecca Framow. Uh, unfortunately, my two colleagues who are presenting with me are not able to be here live today. Uh, so they've sent recordings uh, and will be responding to questions and so forth through the chat throughout, throughout the presentation. So please don't hesitate to uh, text anything that, you, uh, that you're curious about as we go. Um, so I am the Digital Preservation Manager uh, at GBH in the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Uh, and as part of that, I also have responsibility for the PB Core Metadata Standard. Um, my co-presenters today are Lorena Ramirez Lopez, uh, who is the uh, community manager for uh, the Web Recorder Project, the community developer, um, and Juana Suarez, a Latin American cinema scholar and media preservation specialist, um, who is also the uh, director for the Moving Image Archive and Preservation Program at NYU. Um, we'll also be representing the work of Pamela Visner, uh, a media archivist from Chile, uh, who has uh, participated in NYU's audiovisual preservation program since 2013. Um, and we are all going to be talking about the process of translation for preservation. Uh, so my part of this project is that, uh, as I mentioned, I am responsible for the PB Core metadata standard. Um, around the time that we first started developing, uh, doing work on this standard, which we've been developing for the past several years as it came into GBH's responsibility, um, over the course of the whole time that I have been in charge of this, people have been coming up to me at annual presentations and commenting that it would be really useful for the documentation to be available for this standard in Spanish. Um, English language resources dominate the preservation landscape. Translated documentation is vital to allow for resource sharing. Um, this screenshot represents a list of audiovisual cataloging resources that are available in Spanish. This list was compiled as part of an unpaid volunteer effort by bilingual archivists at the Association of Moving Image Archivist Hack Day. Bilingual archivists are often asked to do extra work to make these resources available and accessible without equivalent compensation as part of you know, volunteer uh, community uh, support. Uh, and that is something that I believe and we all think is a little bit problematic. Um, so as I mentioned, PB Core was, uh, is currently under the responsibility of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. It was originally funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Uh, and rounds of development on it have recently been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, NEH has funded several rounds of development and promotion in the past. We were recently invited to submit a grant for an education and training project, and we decided that because we'd, been re you know, we'd received all this interest in making PB Core available in Spanish, that we would try and build that development specifically into the grant so that we could actually uh, you know, get translators who understood audiovisual preservation terminology pay them an equivalent rate for their work and work closely with them to try and make this documentation available. Uh, this is also available, you know, we, we could make a strong argument for this under NEH's grant protocols because the American Archive of Public Broadcasting has significant Spanish language content and we don't have any Spanish speaking archivists on staff. Uh, so this is also a huge problem for us and something that more broadly we need to address. So this is what we see as a first step in trying to make our resources more available. PB Core is uh, often used as a guideline for cataloging or describing audiovisual content. Uh, it's used as a model for building custom databases and applications, or a guideline for identifying sets of vocabularies. But underlying it all is an XML standard. So the first thing that we had to decide when translating is what were we going to translate? Because it's one thing to translate the documentation around it, and it's another thing to actually translate the underlying XML code. And my colleague, Lorena Ramirez-Lopez, who led the translation team on this project, is going to talk more about that and about the actual project of doing the translation right now. Hello. So you'll just be hearing my voice, but I first want to thank Rebecca so much for her patience and moderating this panel and now moderating it with just recorded voices. Amazing. Thank you, Rebecca. And Hopefully, I'm piggybacking off of her last slide, which is code is not neutral, and it's not, not at all. Code is not language neutral. We may have heard the term UTF-8. It's an encoding system for Unicode, and it's the World Wide Web's most common character encoding. And while there are non-English speakers who code, all modern programming tools are based on ASCII, A-S-C-I-I. The character set. And ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. This encodes a character set 
based on Western culture that is solely based on an English language and Latin character sets. And just to show you how programming, if programming were more open, on the right, you should see what code coding in Arabic would be, which would be right to left. I highly recommend viewing Ramzi Nasir's work, Gilp. Um, it's, it is a functional programming language written entirely in Arabic that is a conceptual art piece because while Kelp doesn't use the traditional UTF-8 encoding for the front end user to see, the JavaScript in the back end is all UTF-16 and written in English. So unfortunately, translating the code of PBCore wouldn't be practical nor sustaining as code itself isn't really capable of that which is why it's important to not only translate the documentation, but also to explain the context, like examples, situation, and what it means to code. And even though I will be talking about language, specifically the English and Spanish languages, I do want to stress that it's not just about language. For users to understand and actually use the schema in any tool, we, as content creators and maintainers, need to give agency to better serve these publics to make their own historical records. We need to question the agency of our platforms. And the most common obstacle we all have and will encounter is funding, the finances. There is never enough. The cost is too high. The cost is in dollars, euros, or pounds. I mean, this conference itself required a free, a very high fee to not only attend, but just to present online, and not even that, you're hearing my voice right now. If we as a community cannot even create a sliding scale or make these conference platforms more accessible to our international colleagues, we are just gonna be hearing the same voices in our poor attempt of inclusivity and diversity. So when GBH proposed this project, it's setting a precedent that translation can be allocated within a budget. And I'm sure we're all aware of Google Translate, the extension that we can add to our websites, but even as advanced as the Google Translate app is getting, it is not going to translate the technical concept and instructions that are required for our tools. And translation work, like any work, should be paid work. And yes, I'm agreeing with all you if you're thinking, but Spanish is not all the same. It's not. Not all Spanish is the same Spanish. But as you'll see in the website and examples in the handbook, our team focused on the concept of PBCore to explain how to use it rather than literal translations. And we researched a lot of documents and technical instructions because yes, a lot already does exist in Spanish language. So we did our due diligence. So for this translation project, we had a team of four, two translators for English to Spanish, two proofreaders for English to Spanish, and our translator, translators Gloria Diaz and Valeria Davila come from Argentina. Our proofreaders were Zutsu Matsin and myself. Zutsu is from Mexico. And while I am born and raised in New York City, I am a heritage speaker where my mom is from Paraguay and my dad is from Chile. While Spanish is a common language, technical Spanish is very niched. So we had the added bonus that I am also a program developer for English and Spanish communities. And all four of us are part of the AV archiving community. So if we go to the next slide, on the left, I broke down what we did for our team and what you might need to keep in mind and prep for your own project. Because I highly recommend everyone allocating for this. So first off, allocate money in your budget. If you're wondering how much the rate you would be, Spanish is one of the most common and translated. Google is your friend, you can Google that. And if you're still worried, you can always ask. I've done translations, Juana has done translations. There's a way, you can ask any one of us. And two tools that I want to highlight before I go over how to prep for your own translation project is a tool called From the Page. It's an online tool that will have the PDF version of your original text on one side and your translation on the other. So you have both on the screen, which it seems simple, but it's a very big time saver for some translations. And a lot of the inspiration and motivation for me, at least, was the Programming Historian website, 
So this team has English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese all on their website. Granted, this is a volunteer group, and a lot of them are programmers, so the budget is a little bit different. But if you need inspiration or help, there are communities that will help you make your website more accessible for, with language. So how to do it. There are other ways to share information other than just text. And I'm not just thinking about videos. Photos and screenshots are very useful. If you have content or blog post or instructions on a workflow or a project, and maybe you or your team can't afford that translation, but you're willing for it to be circulated and shared, putting licensing information for attribute and share alike allow users to be able to translate it. For example, if you use a Creative Commons license and put no derivatives, this also means no translations can be done. And it's totally understandable if you don't want to have if you want to have control of your content and you don't want it to be translated. That's okay. If you're okay with translations, make sure that your contact information is available so users can contact you and ask for permission. And while this last one seems like a no-brainer, alarms. And while this last one seems like a no-brainer, this is very important because with your original, with because with your original, you can do more translation projects, especially code-based projects, and saving it as a Word doc or a text document rather than a PDF, which be, which would be the final product, makes sharing and collaborating way easier. Also, it makes the document more adaptable because your platform might be different. And this was the part where I was going to do a quick demo, but maybe I'll let Rebecca do it if she's up to, or maybe if the technology allows for it. But translating and proofreading and sharing are just small steps that make a big impact and build communication and collaboration between communities. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Bye. Thank you so much, Lorena. Uh, unfortunately, we are not set up to do the live demo that we hoped we would be able to, but I encourage you to check out the in-progress PBCore Spanish site at pbcore.org, PBCore AV Metadata Espanol, uh, and to contact any of us who worked on the project. Uh, and we will, again, Lorena is in chat and can answer questions, uh, and I'll be able to take questions after. But first, I would like to now turn it over to my colleague, Juana Suarez, uh, who will be providing some notes about archives, translation, and bilingualism in the following recording. My name is Juana Suarez, and I had been told very last minute that we need to pre-record this presentation, so apologies for any glitch, and uh, thank you for your flexibility. Um, I will be speaking on behalf of my colleague and friend, Pamela Wiesner, and myself, and uh, we would like to present some uh, considerations about archives, translation, and bilingualism based on personal and professional experiences. Uh, due to time and space constrictions, we're only going to address the exchange between Spanish, our native uh, language, and English, our language at work. And we will limit the discussion to translation made by human beings, leaving aside software programs and artificial intelligence systems. Google Translate is a very problematic multilingual neural machine that, although preferred by many, and we do use it for quick reference, uh, is extremely problematic, has a lot of limitations, uh, particularly when working with specialized documents. So we could just devote a whole high press to that discussion. As bilingual archivists, um, Pamela and I are often asked to translate documents or materials, and we are well aware of the need for bilingual documents. Both Pamela and I come from different educational backgrounds and are at different stages of our careers. In Pamela's case, her undergraduate training is in audio engineering, music and sound studies. I come from the field of literature, cultural studies and cinema. Both my undergraduate and graduate studies included translation courses, yet I am not a certified translator. I have also trained as an interpreter in court for undocumented migrants, but this has been done through volunteering groups, not through formal education. Before coming to the archival profession, linguistics was at the core of my training as professor of Spanish as a second language. 
Pamela and I share training in the MIA program and the leadership of our audiovisual preservation exchange, a project with high visibility in Latin America. And this has like provided us opportunities to draw reflections uh, from our work with different Spanish speaking countries and communities, which is my preferred term rather than Hispanics. Um, and so we also share an awareness of the need for better translations. We have a good grasp of the Spanish speaking archival communities, and we have channeled efforts to contribute better translated resources motivated by the need to professionalize this area of the profession. We are often at dismay to see the quality of technical translations, the poor quality of translations of everyday material, and the lack of conversation around the topic. Hence, we appreciate Rebecca's Rebecca Framos effort to have us in this conversation in this panel. Pamela and I are far from offering systematic efforts. However, we do take pride in our good command of Spanish and good writing skills in our native language, which already helps. Hmm. So this was a preamble to tell you a little bit who we are and to legitimate a little bit why we are speaking about this. But this is going to be the division of our presentation today. So let's start by some considerations about suitability and credentials of the translator. We might not have the need to remind everybody here that translation and interpreted are careers, fields of study and professions with millenary traditions. So not every person that speaks the language is an interpreter or a translation. These terms are not interchangeable and each one demands specific linguistic abilities. Uh, and this is also very important because we do want to make the disclaimer that we, we, we do this presentation with a lot of respect for people that are not translators and have ventured into these um, uh, fields. So in the context of Spanish, um, in, in the context of Spanish speaking culture, one of the first references is the story of Maritzin, La Malinche, the indigenous woman who learned Spanish and became Mexican conquistador Hernán Cortés interpreter. In the Mexican imaginary, Malinchista refers to a person who favors foreign culture over Mexicanness. That's a um, negative term. But this is already complicated because for Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex, and Mexican American culture, the Malinche acquires a different connotation, one marked by migration and displacement. And these are cultural nuances that we will refer to later. We can also not forget that La Malinche is a feminist icon for Chicanas and Chicanex. So translation is a profession and it is taught either as an MA in many universities across the world or as a certificate. And if you were to visit any of these websites, there are many universities, these are examples, you will see that in the curriculum, the big emphasis is Spanish grammar and language copy editing skills. Um, and I know that everybody, according to the language that they are trying to learn, they always say that the, the, the grammar is challenging and they tend to think that they need vocabulary. Vocabulary is not good if you don't have the structure of the language. Spanish does have uh, in common with Romance languages, French, Italian, Portuguese, issues such as gender agreement, conjugation of verbs, problematic prepositions such as por and para, the verb to be that in Spanish can be ser or estar, um, past tense can be preterite versus imperfect. We have two modes, the indicative and the subject, subjunctive, uh, indirect, direct object pronouns, verbs like gustar and um, verbs that express liking, irregular verbs. So I would say that repeated mistakes with these basic grammar issues are usually the markers of mid command of Spanish and not without fluency. And um, people that have a lot of issues with these grammar things to be indicative and subjunctive, uh, por para should not be working as translators. A salient feature of the plethora of translations that we see every day in the United States, the transportation system, safety warnings, stores, health advisory, social services, is the lack of professional and specialized services. There is a general misconception that the fact that you speak the language makes, makes you a de facto translator or interpreter. As I think I mentioned, I have a collection of 
uh, pictures that I have taken that I am not going to show here, but is extremely problematic. In linguistic discussions, there is a difference between a native speaker, a heritage speaker, and a language two learner. Language two will be Spanish, speakers of another language that learn Spanish. And so such difference is not based on hierarchies of any sort. It is really based on the command of the language, in the command of Spanish. Same as in English and in any other language, not every Spanish speaker has good spelling, uh, wide vocabulary, and refined writing skills. Likewise, not all of them are trained to understand and explain language nuances and linguistic variations. So we know that every person that speaks English is not necessarily a good writer in English. And this is very different from the obsession that some cultures have for the speakers with no accent. So I think it's important to define what is a heritage speaker. A heritage speaker is a person who has learned a language informally by being exposed to it at home as opposed to having learned it formally in a school setting. It may be their native tongue, the language they identify as being their primary language, but more often than not, their heritage language becomes secondary to English. So it, it, it really, there, in a way, there's a difference also between primary language versus first language. For most heritage speakers in this Spanish English context, English is the first language because it's the one that they really use in formal education and is used the most in their daily love life outside the home. Of course, there is a lot of affect that is involved in the concept of primary language. And uh, because of the very problematic history of uh, Latin American migration in particular, um, Spanish, there are periods of history in the states in which Spanish has been suppressed for families so that the children get a sense of belonging to the culture. So this is extremely complicated. It's also important to distinguish heritage speaker from second language learners. A heritage speaker may speak the language easily and fluidly, what we call fluency, but may not have learned the language to its full functional capacity. So this is not a failing on the heritage speaker, it's not criticism, but a recognition that fluency does not always equal proficiency in all context. The person may speak Spanish really well, but might have a lot of problems in uh, writing. Also, heritage speakers and second language speakers, you, usually when we are in a world, um, for example, I was trained as a professor of Spanish, so I can communicate with many of these speakers without issues because I am trained to understand um, their, their their grammar mistakes and I still can make meaning. Um, so let's see, these are like very uh, common phenomena from heritage speakers, um, code switching, language transfer, faulty agreement, uh, subject verb agreement, gender agreement, singular plural indicative subjunctive and misuse of false cognates. Um, I, was some, I was talking to somebody yesterday, a Spanish heritage speaker and he, talk, he kept talking, he kept using the word tributario to, to use to talk about rivers. The word in English is tributary, but in Spanish is affluente. I, I know what he meant um, anyhow, because I know the word in English. For other people, um, speaking about tributaries, um, about rivers will be very difficult to understand. Um, so this will be our recommendation for a uh, credentials of a translator. Check that the person is certified. If you cannot get a certified translator, then check that it's a native speaker, a heritage speaker, or a language to a speaker with solid and demonstrated writing skills, extensive vocabulary, and writing sophistication. Um, or try to get a professor of Spanish as a second language with trajectory in writing and assessing tests. Um, Let's go to cultural awareness. I hope that you can see Equatorial Guinea here. Um, Spanish is spoken in 20, 21 countries, 20 out of 21 Spanish is spoken as a result of colonialism, colonialism from Spain. And at times coexisting in these countries, in many cases, we Spanish coexists with indigenous languages that still struggle for recognition. We also have to keep in mind that Spanish comprises 18.7 uh, Spanish speakers of the population in the States, 
And I have written the word Hispanics in quotations because it's a homogenizing word that is extremely problematic. Um, so this effect of colonialism is often requested, uh, reflected in the use of usted to emboss. Um, that is very problematic. Uh, memory uh, heritage institutions in Latin America in particular still work under a very colonial frame, 18th, 19th century frames. And so the use of usted becomes very important because in many of these institutions, the to and the voz, which is very informal in written language, is not really used. Uh, there's also like the difference of words. We still understand each other, but the, the difference in meaning from country to country might cause bewildering to some people. A very common mistake is coger. It's not a good word in Mexico. Uh, it means to grab in any other country. Uh, but this is important because you have to adapt translation to the nuances of languages. And, um, and then we also have the issue of neoliberalism and the speedy flux of contact with technology. We also, also see a lot of over translation of English terms that have been assimilated into Spanish and do not require translation. The case is often that people outside the United States are more familiar with English. And that's also an effect of neocolonialism. And even if people do not speak the language, a lot of people in Spanish speaking archives have a lot of English vocabulary. Sad but truth, the United States is a very monolingual country. So these are very important cultural nuances that have to be keep, kept in mind. When you are selecting documents to be translated, please assess the need and future of the translation. What we think is a good document in uh, English might not be the document that is needed in a Spanish speaking context, particularly when we are translated practical documentation such as manual or technical guides. In many cases, they come with a specific tools that also need to be translated. So if the tool is not translated, the translation of the document is not very useful. Um, so you also need to assess what additional translated resources you will be needing along with the translation. Translation, Collective volunteer-based translations are not except from checking the translation credentials, and they might be subject to the nuances of Spanish, linguistic and semantic differences from country to country. You might have a person from Chile, another person from Puerto Rico, a native Spanish speaker, a heritage speaker. So you also don't want a quilt translation. It's important to check the, the, the credential described. Might be the case that a coll collective volunteer-based translation works for a short text, but not for a long specialized document. Also, um, I think that it's important that in the profession, we approach translation as collaboration and not as service, because the service is already uh, an extension of colonialism. So provide opportunities to Spanish speaking communities to share their own knowledge and thoughts and really decide what documents need to be translated. E, um, we have here assess if training will be needed to go along with the translation and the cost and functionality of it. We live in a uh, time of podcasts and webinars, and that's not always what the translation needs. In situ and in person uh, training might be very important for the translation that you are making. And finally, translations do get old, so assess how often the translation will need an update something that we wrote 10 years ago and might, need, might seem like a useful resource, probably needs um, updating regarding language on digital storage, digital preservation, et cetera. Finally, some, translation, some suggestions on how to budget the cost of translation, check the credentials of the translators. Um, as any other outsource service, get quotes for price and service comparisons. Talk to the providers of the service. And uh, this is the same that you will do for any other thing that you do that is outsource. The person who is translating for the stores, hospitals, and the transportation system is not necessarily the person who will do a good job translating a document in an over-specialized fields like ours. 
if the person has only translated literature and poetry, might not be the person to be doing a digital translation. In that regard, translators need to assess the type of document before they commit to the job, and they might be able to tell you if they are going to need a consulting team or a consulting person for specific nuances, vocabulary, and technicalities. Our conclusion, good translation should be part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. After all, we are attempting to negotiate meaning and content on equal terms with colleagues and clients from other cultures and their language needs. Their language needs to be treated with the same level of professionalism we expect to see in English written text. Thank you very much. I'm getting noise in the background, so I think I have to stop here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, My name for, is Juana Suarez. Uh, for bearing with our uh, technically complex presentation today uh, as we brought in speakers from various parts of the world. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about the PBCore translation project. Again, my colleagues are available uh, on chat in the uh, virtual conference presentation uh, and also available to be reached via email. Uh, and do you have any follow-up thoughts? Sorry, I, it's difficult. Oh, yes, hello. Um, down at the front here. Uh, thanks, Christian. Uh, sorry, Richard Lahane from the, I, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Just, just on the PB court translation, you, it, it's, it seemed like um, you, you, you did reach the decision not to translate the XML elements and attributes, but just but to focus on translating the, the documentation and, and sur surrounding information. Um, I, I mean, I, I suppose it is possible to translate it if you set the language to UTF-8, but I, is, is it, but it was that if you had UTF-8, but then you've got special, but you've got Spanish characters, is it just the downstream effects of breaking other tools? Uh, yeah, what, what, what were the, those technical difficulties that you foresaw in, in, in doing that? So uh, we definitely did foresee technical difficulties in changing the characters of the uh, of the text of the standard, and translating the text of the standard would also mean you know the the standard is intended to be human readable. So the elements and attributes in XML utilize English terminology when we say things like what is the title, what is the description. Uh, these are all you know the element name is PB core description. We couldn't make a Spanish language of that of of the standard that used the Spanish to describe the element names and the attribute names that would be more usable for the Spanish community. But that would mean that we had to maintain two different versions of the standard, uh, a project that is continue right now based entirely on soft money from, uh, from grant funding. Um, doesn't seem like it would be responsible for us to attempt to maintain both versions of the standard and to promise that we could do that in perpetuity. So instead, uh, we focused our efforts on ensuring that every element, every asset, every term used had a full and complete definition in Spanish so that someone could cross-reference it if they chose to use the standard. Thank you. I, I had a question, if I may. Of course. I used the word quite early on, unpaid mm -hmm. labor. Yes. And I was very struck that that was very similar to what we heard about in the keynote this morning. And I wondered what, what reflections you have on that and sustainability of translation work. Yes, of course. Um, I think that, you know, it, it is the, the two challenges are quite interrelated uh, and that often people who have this cultural expertise, who come from communities that uh, are multilingual or whose collection materials are in another language, are asked to put in this work to ensure that their materials can be accessed by English-speaking audiences, or to try you know, to put in the work on their own to ensure that the, the materials that are made available by an English institution can then be brought back to their communities. Um, and again, that's effort that's, you know, that's something that's kind of being asked for 
by the, the predominant institutions, uh, yes, we've made this wonderful resource. Now, this should provide your community everything it needs. You just need to make sure that they can read it. Um, with no support being offered uh, and no kind of opportunity for genuine dialogue. So ensuring that, that there is adequate compensation for doing this work um, and that this, this you know, uh, dialogue through different ling languages and you know, making resources available in, in different languages is always going to be work. It's always going to be challenging. Um, so I think it is, it is our responsibility if we're creating new materials, new documentation, to try, and we're expecting people to take advantage of it, to try and think about how to ensure that we're not putting more work on people in doing so, uh, at least not without compensation to, to balance that out. Thank you. Anything coming through on Slido? No? Just watching. Hi. Oh, is it two? Maureen and then back row behind Maureen. Uh, yes. Thank you, Susan. I did an extra big wave there uh, so you could see me. Uh, thank you very much for a really interesting set of presentations. Uh, it really brings to the fore the importance of having um, translations out there for the wider community to take uh, advantage of. I mean, I just wanted to highlight the excellent work, actually, that the DPC has done in regards to this, particularly over the pandemic period. Um, there's been an increase in the number of uh, translated works on the DPC website that have been made available. Um, and it just, it, it's testament to the strength of the, and the diversity of the community within the DPC and, and the different languages represented that people are willing and able to step up, um, often in a professional capacity, so not necessarily in volunteer time, and to provide these expert translations so that the wider community can take advantage of them. And I just wanted to ask as well, you know, what kind of a role um, do, do our panelists see for our international membership organizations who've got this wide network in terms of language diversity uh, to facilitate this kind of thing going forwards? Well, unfortunately, uh, my laptop has died. I was hoping to be able to see if my panelists um, would have responses in the chat, and I'm sure that they do. Uh, but I cannot see them because my computer is out of power. Um, for myself, what I would say uh, is that I think that there is a very robust role for international communities to play, but I think that, um, and that it's, it's wonderful when people do feel able to volunteer time or to participate in these enterprises as part of their professional responsibilities. But what I would love to see is for these international communities to perhaps set aside funding and provide stipends or you know, make those available for people to do that work and be compensated for it as part of the professional uh, or international community doing that work. Thank you. And if right in the back row there? Oh, no, I was in the side of her way. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It had the, it had the desired effect, yeah. Um, okay. If there's no more questions, I think it leaves me with the, the great pleasure of thanking all of our speakers, both in the room and not in the room this afternoon. And I want to thank... Yes. Uh, so I do have, thank you so much, uh, a response from my colleague, Juana, uh, about the... the translation work, you know, the, the question that was just asked. Um, and she says, the fact that translation work is considered volunteering is very problematic. It is a lot of work and research, and that's why there are trained professionals to do it. Technical translations are more expensive uh, and should be more compensated accordingly. Uh, and languages also respond to hierarchies. Some languages are cheaper from the view of people asking for, uh, for translations, but the work and difficulty is challenging regardless. And that's also something to consider when thinking about how to support this work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you to Meki, Lotta, Eva, Tamara, Rebecca, Juana, and Lorena. Thank you very much.